One effective method of isolating transistors from each other is to create them on an insulating substrate. So, for all our dis discussions, we assumed that the substrate uh, of the wafer will be the body of all the NMOS transistors. And then when we try to create PMOS transistors, we have to create a well for these transistors. This particular way of thinking about MOSFETs is why we managed to create uh, parasitic bipolars and why we exposed ourselves to the possibility of latch up. Another way of thinking about substrates is to think about substrates as insulators. So what if we create a substrate that is formed of some kind of insulator like uh, glass, for example, and then on top of it, we have a thin layer of uh, semiconductor in which we create our transistors. As we will see, it's even more complicated than this, but there are a few advantages to this. First of all, it will allow us to create each transistor in isolation, reducing the path between transistors and each other to a path through a perfect insulator. This will uh, prevent the creation of parasitic bipolars and will remove the threat of latch up. Silicon on insulator technology also has other advantages, particularly in terms of leakage. As we will see, the amount of body we have available for the transistor is just enough to allow the formation of a channel. This will prevent the creation of sneak path between uh, the drain and the channel and will prevent a very destructive phenomenon called drain-induced barrier lowering, which we will discuss later on. Uh, drain-induced barrier lowering greatly increases one form of leakage called uh, subthreshold conduction. And uh, using silicon and insulator actually uh, pretty much elim eliminates this, especially when we combine it with multiple gate MOSFETs. So um, silicon and insulator technology is not without its trouble. It has uh, technological challenges and it also offers challenges in uh, working with the transistors once they have been fabricated. But the first question is, how do you actually create um, silicon on transistor, uh, silicon on insulator transistors? And one way to do this is um, the CMOX process in which we uh, create a buried layer of insulator. And this buried layer of insulator will then be uh, the insulator upon which the transistors are formed and it's sandwiched between two uh, semiconductor uh, layers. The, the bottom semiconductor layer will uh, just provide mechanical support while the top one will be the epitaxial layer in which we form the transistors. Uh, the CMOX process uh, uses high energy ion implantation to implant an oxygen rich layer into uh, the depth of the wafer. When we heat the wafer the uh, deep layer of the wafer will then be oxidized, creating a buried oxide which uh, forms the insulating layer upon which uh, the transistors can be made. Uh, another way to uh, create uh, silicon and insulator to, uh, tra transistors is to use uh, wafers, just normal wafers, and then grow insulator on either or both wafers, and then flip the two wafers and bring them together and we can just bond them together using glue. Um, in this case, it has to be a very effective glue, um, usually some kind of epoxy or like uh, um, a very uh, permanent glue, which is also resistant to moisture and humidity. Uh, in all cases, what we managed to do is we managed to create uh, an insulating layer uh, upon which uh, the transistors can be created. There's always a uh, bottom layer of semiconductor, which provides mechanical support. But when we say silicon on insulator, we are talking about the top layer of insulator uh, where we create the transistors. Now, um, this, is, this shows a PMOS transistor and an NMOS transistor created next to each other. Uh, as we can see in the NMOS transistor, we have source and drain and plus, and in the PMOS transistor, we have P plus. And then we have the gates of the two transistors, and these are created um, as with a normal CMOS process. The only difference is we also have to create uh, individual bodies or individual channels for each of the transistors. And so 
we create uh, an, indiv an individual layer of P-type uh, semiconductor for this NMOS, an individual layer of N-type semiconductor for this uh, PMOS, and for each individual transistor, we will create their own bodies. These bodies will then form channels when we turn on the transistors and we become bodies again when we turn off the transistors. Uh, as I mentioned, there are two advantages to this approach. Uh, one of them is that the path between the NMOS and the PMOS is now pretty much non-existent. There are no parasitic bipolars between the two because there's nothing between the two. There's just an insulator between the two. You can think of it as an extreme form of uh, trench isolation or even of low cost where the uh, field oxide is grown so thick that it actually uh, surrounds and, and, and envelops each individual transistor and its channel, not just the, the transistor, but the transistor including its body and its channel. The other advantage of this structure is that we now have very narrow bodies for these uh, transistors. We will not understand why this is advantageous until we start discussing leakage, but the point is that the drain now has a lot less area through which it can couple towards the channel. This reduces the possibility of leakage, particularly a, a specific kind of leakage called subthreshold conduction, because the drain can have a detrimental effect on this kind of, of leakage. There are challenges, as I said, not only with the fabrication of, of silicon on insulator chips, but also with their operation. Uh, the main problem here is that this body is now floating. Uh, there's nothing defining the voltage of this body. When we uh, dealt with a single well process, the potential of the body of the end mass was ground, and the potential of the well of the PMOS was supply. It was very simple. It allowed us to understand the operation of the transistors uh, with ease. In this case, the bodies are floating. So what do we do with this? How does this inform our design uh, decisions? What this does is it actually causes the body to have some sort of memory. It's now sort of a floating capacitance of its own. So when you turn on the transistor and then turn it off, you have to recall that it was turned on in the first place because there will be some time before the body manages to reach a known voltage. It will take some time for it to reabsorb the electrons that form the channel. And um, in fact, there are two types of floating bodies that we can, uh, that we can use, uh, partially depleted bodies and fully depleted bodies. So we're talking about P-type or N-type bodies in this case. Uh, but usually when we form floating bodies like this, we deplete them. So this is depleted silicon. Uh, it's either going to be partially depleted or fully depleted. Why do we deplete the bodies? We deplete them to provide them with uh, a dearth of carriers. This allows, us, allows the transistor, when it is cut off, to quickly reabsorb all excess carriers in the channel and thus to return to a known state quickly. However, because it is depleted, it is difficult to know its voltage at a specific time. So silicon on insulator transistors are useful in terms of their latch up properties and leakage properties, but they are challenging in terms of fabrication and operation.